Hi everyone and welcome to this AJ Bell webinar entitled Beyond Stavely Pensions and Inheritance Tax. Uh, my name is Charlene Young, I'm one of the senior technical consultants here at AJ Bell. I'm really pleased to be with you today. So let's begin. Looking through some of these headlines, pensions just became an even better way to avoid inheritance tax. You might think we finally have some clarity on whether pensions are free from inheritance tax. Now, I know we are all in need of some good news lately. Um, and even if you haven't seen the outcome of last month's Supreme Court judgment, um, this case has been rumbling on for over a decade. Um, so it no doubt crossed some of our desks at some point, if not those of our colleagues. Um, and whilst this judgment, as you can see from the headlines, is undoubtedly good news in part, at least, for Mrs. Stavely's representatives, um, in our view, there are still unanswered questions affecting clients and financial planners more generally. Okay, so as I've just said, the topic of today's webinar is pensions and inheritance tax. Um, before we get stuck in, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, regular listeners um, will know how this works probably better than myself, um, as my colleagues Lisa and Rachel have been hosting webinars all throughout lockdown and beyond and doing a fantastic job. Um, the content of this webinar is for a professional advisor audience only. Um, Please feel free to ask questions at any time using the panel on your right hand side. Um, these will be seen by the moderator and answered via email back to you in due course. Um, please also let us know of any technical problems using that question box. Following the end of the webinar, you'll receive an email from us asking you to complete a feedback form. We'd love to know what you think of today, along with any ideas for future topics. Um, you'll also receive a CPD certificate and a copy of the slides. Okay, so let's get stuck into today's agenda. Um, it's a very topical session, so that gives us a chance to kind of get back behind the headlines that we've seen, uh, refresh our knowledge of the rules, and look at if or how things might look in the future following the Supreme Court judgment in the case of Mrs. Stavely. Um, it's going to be at a fairly high technical level and fast paced, so um, for those of you who are into that thing, I hope you enjoy. Okay. Um, so you'll see from the slide we've got four topics to go through today and um, we're going to have a quick refresher on IHT and pensions more generally, um, a spotlight on the Stavely versus HMRC case and the Supreme Court appeal um, and then we're going to round up with um, a look at the current complexity regarding pensions and IHT, whether the Stavely case affects anything and finally sort of where we might go next where might policymakers look um, to, to make changes, if anything, at all. Okay, doke. So, straight into our refresher of IHT and pensions. Um, although we are often told uh, that pensions are free from IHT, uh, where a client had pension provision other than the state pension, there are forms that need to be completed upon their death. Uh, this is done using the form IHD 409 in respect of pensions and hopefully you can see that on the screen now. So in terms of death benefits, what information is reported on the 409 and when might HMRC actually deem IHT as payable in respect of pension death benefits? So on death it comes down to whether or not the estate was entitled to or guaranteed to receive benefits due to be paid out on the death of a member. Um, the first example you can see there are death benefits paid according to a binding nomination. So a beneficiary is named by the client in an instruction to the pension scheme trustees or administrator and they must follow this instruction. So in this case the trustees do not have any discretion over the distribution of the death benefits which is what most of us are kind of used to um, certainly in regards to SIPs. And there are also instances when a member's estate is to receive the death benefit. So examples here um, include Section 32 buyout plans, retirement annuity, annuity contracts. And a quick note here just on spouse and civil partner exemption. Um, this is generally available in respect of death benefits, whether falling into the estate somehow, perhaps one of the three options that I've put above. Um, so if a beneficiary in the binding nomination was the member's spouse or civil partner, or a death payment was made to the estate and the will directed this to the spouse or civil partner, the spousal exemption to IHT is generally available um, in regards to these sums. 
Okay, the second type of circumstances where it can get a bit more complicated um, is the concept of lifetime transfers. Okay, these li lifetime transfers are known often as dispositions and examples include changes to benefits within two years of death. So things like transfers between pension schemes, contributions made to pensions, or writing death benefits into trust. So back to our section 32 death benefits, they might have ordinarily been paid to the estate of the client. Um, it is possible to write these death benefits into trust. Um, but if you do this within two years of the client's death, um, it will be picked up on the 409 form. Okay, so just examples of the boxes on that 409 where you might be uh, entering such details. So the premise here is that if a lifetime transfer is carried out when a member is in serious ill health, um, so any of these options, contributions, transfers, writing death benefits into trust, um, and then they subsequently die within two years, this previous disposition that occurred in their lifetime can actually have a significant value when it comes to IHT, um, akin to a gift perhaps. Um, although these lifetime events or acts are only reported upon the death of the client using the form and the boxes you see in front of you. Um, the lifetime transfer um, is an event, act or gift that occurred in the client's lifetime. This is an important distinction as it means uh, that no spousal exemption is available um, against any claim that might be made by a, a HMRC for high IHT. So, Although the spouse might be the ultimate beneficiary of any death benefits paid after the client's death, um, perhaps under the discretion of the SIP trustees, um, the IHT here is claimed by HMRC in respect of lifetime acts, and that is the reason no spousal exemption is available for lifetime transfers, um, unlike death benefits in the previous slide. Okay, so zoning in on pension transfers a little more closely. Um, why do HMRC sometimes claim for IHT? Okay, so HMRC take the view that at the point of the transfer, the member has the theoretical opportunity to redirect death benefits under the new pension plan to their estate. So the best way to think of this is when you fill out a new application form and perhaps the client will complete a new expression of wish or nomination of beneficiaries. Um, notification as part of the application form. So one of the most common questions um, I and the team get asked on this topic is, well, what is the likely inheritance tax bill then? Um, with gifts in respect of non-pensions assets, it's easier to manage client expectations. Um, IHT is payable on what HMRC value as the loss to the estate. And that's actually the same premise here with pension transfers. It's just we have to sort of look at the calculation in a little bit more detail um, in order to help perhaps manage clients' expectations. Um, this actual calculation is done on a case-by-case -case basis by HMRC actuaries. So um, visibility is, isn't there um, for us to analyze in, in great detail, but we can go on what um, we have discussed in our conversations and some anecdotal evidence from cases that we have seen. So in general, we are looking at the loss to the estate, and this will be the difference between the amount that could have been directed to the estate as death benefits, as part of that new application that I mentioned, and what the client could have accessed at the point of transfer from the new pension plan, so any lifetime pension benefits. The most important thing to remember here is, is not the whole pension transfer value or CETV, um, it is looking at the loss to the estate. So we've got our red box and we've got our gray box. So the red box takes the death benefit lump sum value, adjusted for growth and the time um, between transfer and death, um, discounted to present value using a discount rate. So this number is typically what could have been directed to the estate on the new pension scheme application form. We then take away the amounts calculated in our grey box. So the grey box is the value of the pension benefits that could have been drawn from the new scheme following the transfer. Um, after pension freedoms, this could be, for instance, um, a UFPLS, so uncrystallized funds, pension lump sum, net of income tax. Okay, so the difference between those two amounts in the red and the grey boxes is the deemed loss to the estate on which IHT is then subsequently claimed. Okay, so the sooner the member dies after a, a serious ill health transfer, the bigger the value of that red box um, 
and the bigger potential loss to the estate. So that's where we talk about um, transfers sort of with, within two years of death. Um, the longer um, after the transfer, before the client's death, the more that red box value is discounted um, and the less um, it's less likely there will be a claim from IH, uh, for IHT from HMRC. In terms of the question um, surrounding likely values, so our calculations and the, the evidence we've seen and the conversations we've had with HMRC tell us that this could typically, worst case scenario, be around 30% of the pension transfer value or CETV. So for instance, um, a member who transferred um, and had a CETV of £600,000, if they were in extremely poor health and knew about it at the time of that transfer and they actually died soon after, so within the year, um, the deemed loss to the estate could be around £180,000 there, so 30% of that CETV. IHT could then perhaps be claimed by, uh, by HMRC um, at the rate of 40%. Um, so that's just an indication there. Um, again, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. There's not a lot of visibility of the calculation. Um, so it's kind of difficult to, to provide a concrete answer, which isn't ideal when obviously you're trying to manage clients' expectations. Okay, so we've kind of gone through uh, a recap of the rules and the theory um, behind some of this. And now we're going to have a bit of a spotlight um, on the Stavely case. I hope you're still with me anyway. I did warn you that this session wasn't for the faint-hearted. Um, so last month we were handed down the judgment in the case of Mrs. Stavely versus HMRC from the Supreme Court, the kind of final appeal from the highest court um, where it could be heard. Um, just a little bit of background to bring everyone up to speed. Um, Mrs. Stavely deceased. She was a member of a Section 32 pension plan. Um, following a, an acrimonious divorce from her ex-husband, she wanted to ensure that he could not benefit from any excess pension fund in the event of her death. Okay, so that might sound a bit strange, but um, the rules pre ADA certainly could could have surrendered some funds back from the back to the the company that she formerly ran with her ex-husband, Moreford Limited, and that was actually still in the hands of her ex-husband. Um, so following this divorce, she wanted to make sure that there was as little chance as possible for him to benefit um, upon her death from any surrender of excess funds. Um, Mrs. Stavely received a terminal diagnosis of cancer in 2006. Um, so to kind of enact this, this plan, if you like, she transferred the Section 32 to a personal pension with AXA. Um, as part of the application, she used the expression of wish form to nominate her two sons as beneficiaries of any death benefits that were later due under the personal pension. Um, unfortunately, she passed away just six weeks later after this transfer. Um, just a quick note, um, her sons were also her beneficiaries under her will, kind of unsurprisingly. Um, the relevance of this will come a little clearer later, but it's worth pointing out now. So why, in the case of Mrs. Stavely and her transfer in ill health, did HMRC come knocking for IHT? So their claim um, centred on the extent to which gratuitous benefit rules set out in the Inheritance Tax Act 1984 mean that pensions transferred in ill health could be subject to IHT. So by way of background, a gratuitous benefit, it's a bit of a horrible phrase, but it's the one in the legislation. Um, it's deemed to occur when a particular action or failure to take a particular action um, in relation to pension funds um, is made with the intention of basically reducing the inheritance tax that could be applied on those funds. So in the case of Mrs. Stavely, HMRC claimed firstly that um, the transfer from the Section 32 policy to the new personal pension plan um, was a transfer under Section 3 of this Inheritance Tax Act. And finally, um, that a disposition was made under Section 3, sub uh, Section 3 was also made um, when Mrs. Staveley failed to exercise her right to draw pension benefits after the transfer. So essentially, HMRC argued that Mrs. Stavely's decision to transfer her pension and then bequeath money to her children um, rather than leave it in the existing Section 32 scheme and allow her ex-husband to benefit um, conferred a gratuitous benefit on her sons and actually secondly um, her failure to take any income or tax free lump sum from her plan after the transfer also did this. Um, the case had previously been heard by three different lower courts um, after HMRC's initial claim 
and had been going on since um, her death in 2006. Okay, just a quick word here where I put IHTA 84, um, I'm just referencing the Inheritance Tax Act for shorthand. Okay, so what are the definitions and the legislation that HMRC were looking to rely on um, in Section 3 of the Act? Okay, so Section 3, uh, subsection 1, is an, is an act that happens in the member's lifetime. So a transfer of value is a disposition, there's that word again, by a transfer or the client in English, and um, that leads to their estate value being immediately less than it was to prior to the transfer. So this kind of makes sense. It's, it's a, a convoluted way of talking about a gift as we might be more familiar. And finally, um, section three, subsection three, an omission to act. So in the red box there, it's where an estate is diminished and another's is increased as a result of a failure to ex exercise a right. So it's almost, you've got an action, an act, a transfer um, that could be caught. And then actually, if you fail to take an action um, or an act in this case, um, you could also be caught. Okay. However, Mrs. Staveley's representatives argued that um, an exemption under Section 10 of the same Act um, to these rules applied in her case. Okay, so they argued um, that Mrs. Staveley's sole motivation was to make sure Murrayford and therefore her ex-husband could not benefit in any way from her pension fund or any excess upon her death. And obviously now we know that she had this terminal diagnosis, so in her view, um, the need to make a transfer was expedited. Okay, so just having a quick look at section 10 here and this exemption um, that the case really centers on. Um, a disposition, so either of those uh, two acts or failure to act in the, in the previous section three is not a transfer of value for IHT purposes, provided it was not intended or not made in any transaction intended to confer a gratuitous benefit. Okay, so here, is our phrase gratuitous benefits again. Um, and this is really, along with section 10, what um, the case really centered on. Um, so here, the word disposition includes a mission to act, as we talked about, and a transaction includes um, one or more or a series of transactions in any associated operation. So they're really looking here at perhaps, was there a convoluted scheme executed by Mrs. Staley to ensure that she maximised the uh, the amount of funds her sons could enjoy um, at the expense of her estate when she was knowingly in ill health. Okay, so in terms of this section 10 exemption, um, Mrs. Stabley's representative said, well, this does definitely apply. Her sole motivation was to get these funds as far away from her ex-husband as possible. Um, she didn't intend to confer any gratuitous benefit on her sons by executing the transfer or failing to take benefits. It really was that sole motivation that was at play here. Um, HMRC made a claim and they said no, because actually under the new plan, the Acts of Personal Pension, Mrs. Stavely no longer had the right to determine where death benefits were paid. Okay, so her Section 32 plan, as we went through in the first section, um, was subject to the wishes in her will as it was payable to her estate and the personal pension was subject to AXA as the provider's discretion. Um, she could and she did nominate her sons who were also beneficiaries under the will. So in Mrs. Stavely's eyes, um, the end beneficiary was exactly the same um, before and after the transfer. Um, HMRC also argued that Mrs. Stavely's failure to take benefits increased the value of her son's estate and diminished hers. So that's after the transfer. Um, together with the transfer to the personal pension, um, they claim that Mrs. Stavely entered into a scheme or a series of transactions that was completely designed to confer a gratuitous benefit on her sons. Um, the difficulty here is actually the onus is on the taxpayers, so um, the ultimate beneficiaries or the representatives of the deceased to prove the motive of the client. Now, um, unless this is documented at the time of transfer, um, which Mrs. Stavely's representative clearly thought it was, um, it's kind of hard to do because the client actually has passed away by the time we get to these claims from HMRC. Um, so I'll come on to that later and maybe what advisors could do with clients to, to ensure um, you know, the motivations for transfers are clear. Okay, so getting to the actual judgment and considerations itself. Um, the Supreme Court considered the case as three separate issues actually. So HMRC had a claim under two issues, Firstly, the Supreme Court looked at the transfer alone. So what I will call transfer issue one, was the transfer alone a transfer of value 
for IHT purposes. Transfer issue two, was the transfer made as part of a wider transaction or series of transactions um, intended to confer a gratuitous benefit? Um, although it's kind of legal speak, here, the, the nuance is very important. So the intention to confer a gratuitous benefit, and that we'll come back to that later. And finally, the omission to act. So was her failure to take benefits from the new plan made deliberately to increase, uh, decrease, sorry, the value of her estate and increase someone else's, um, her son's, for instance. So what did do the Supreme Court have to say? So on issue one, the appeal was successful. Okay, so Mrs. Stavely's ben uh, beneficiaries and representatives successfully argued that the Section 10 exemption that we went through earlier applied. The transfer alone um, was not subject to IHT. On transfer issue two, um, although this was by my majority and in the first transfer issue it was actually unanimous, um, unanimous ruling, um, Section 10 exemption also applied. And again, the transfer was not subject to IHT. Um, so the Supreme Court took the view that the transfer together with the failure to take benefits from the new scheme was not part of a wider convoluted scheme designed um, to confer gratuitous benefit. However, on the third point and the omission to act, um, this was deemed a transfer of value um, subject to section three and the omission itself um, would lead to a charge to IHT. Um, so just going back to transfer issue one, although it's important to note the transfer may have resulted in a be better position for the beneficiaries of Mrs. Stavely, um, as I mentioned before, the legal nuance is all about the intention to confer a gratuitous benefit. Um, it may have, the action may have resulted in a benefit, but her sole intention, as successfully argued by her representatives, was to make sure that her ex-husband did not benefit from any excess um, under the scheme of the original section 32, sorry, um, after her death. So another way I've seen people sort of argue that this could have been um, mitigated was by writing the death benefits into trust. Um, but if she had done that while she had her terminal diagnosis, as we noticed in the um, initial section of this webinar, um, that would have been an assignment and that would have also been caught potentially by the form. Um, so the transfer alone, I think was satisfied and the judges certainly were satisfied unanimously that um, there was a clear sole motivation for that. Um, in terms of the transfer issue two, um, as I mentioned, this was successful on appeal, but only by majority. So um, the majority of the judges felt that although the transfer and then the new nomination um, under the personal pension, um, which the scheme administrator would follow um, full discretion in the payment of benefits rather than the old section 32, um, although it did improve the son's position ultimately on her death, um, it wasn't part of a contrived solution to do so, and it was all about the intention there. Um, the Supreme Court took the view that, yes, um, Mrs. Stavely nominated her sons under the new plan, but she could have actually changed that nomination any point until her death. Um, and she could have actually changed the beneficiaries under her will. So where the old Section 32 plan would have directed the benefits, um, again, up to any point in theory, up to her death, although she didn't do so. Um, the fact that it was, successful by majority rather than unanimous on that second issue um, just shows us what a mess the legislation is still in in our view um, and there's still quite a few unanswered questions that I'll come on to in a second. Um, so finally just in relation to that omission to act um, the court did find unanimously that Mrs Stavely failing to take benefits um, from the new scheme in ill health was a transfer of value for IHT but before anyone um, gets too concerned um, the rules here and this came for IHT wouldn't be valid um, on transfers and subsequent deaths now. Um, this was changed in 2011 following um, the Friar case that some people may be familiar with. Um, so unfortunately for Mrs Stavely's beneficiaries because she passed away in 2006 this was still an issue and a valid claim. Um, again it just shows you how long it's taken for this case to work its way through um, the court system all the way up to the Supreme Court. So for those of you who have to take the unenviable task of going through this potentially and its impacts with clients, especially those who are in health or ill health and considering a transfer, um, although many of the headlines professed it was good news, um, 
unfortunately we do not believe that it automatically means all transfers and are, are now safe okay um in the case of mrs staveley it was easier to an extent and we can see that by the unanimous judgment um certainly on transfer issue one um, because of the specific facts of the case um mrs staveley um, was solely motivated by that desire to stop her husband having a claim on the funds um, and whilst the new provider had full discretion over the distribution of death benefits there was no guarantee um, they weren't wouldn't pay to him although it was very unlikely um, given that they were divorced and he was no longer financially dependent um, as I mentioned before the burden of proof is still on the taxpayer to show what the member's intention was um, so we feel, you know, advisors should be clear in their file notes and recommendations what the objectives and motivations are of clients, particularly those transferring in ill health, which I'm sure most people already do, obviously, as part of, of their advice, but sort of extra care with serious ill health transfers that are still going ahead, um, just to, to make sure what, what the objectives um, and motivations are. So um, perhaps it's for lower charges, um, more flexibility in terms of investment and th those kind of things. So it's all about whether there was an intention to confer gratuitous benefit. If we're just talking about commercial terms here, um, we think perhaps there'll be less appetite from HMRC to go after these cases, but obviously we cannot guarantee that. Um, interestingly, in the detail of the judgment, HMRC were, were criticized really by um, by the judges and certainly Lady Black who, who wrote the judgment for their what they were referred to as their wholly artificial analysis of the transfer of values in the cases of pension transfers in ill health. So going back to that loss to the estate calculation where we compare the death benefits and the lifetime potential benefits and what wasn't taken um, and it, it was really interesting to read that kind of criticism um, because looking at new guidance that HMRC have published following the Supreme Court judgment in the IHT manual, um, if you just read that alone, you'd be forgiven for believing that they'd actually won the case, HMRC themselves. Um, they mentioned in the guidance that they feel the case supported their thinking, their calculations and their theory. Um, but actually reading the detail of the judgment, I sort of hold a, a slightly different view. Um, so the main kind of message here is there is a danger cases could still be caught, um, particularly where the motivation for a transfer is um, enhanced death benefits, perhaps, um, where uh, they might be payable to a wider class of beneficiary. And this is where the client is knowingly in serious ill health. Um, so there is care to be taken. Um, just a quick final note again on the Omission to Act. Um, failure to take pen pension benefits sort of after a transfer, that's no longer an Omission to Act. Um, in terms of the legislation and something that HMRC could come after um, deaths after 2011. Okay, right, so uh, that's kind of a quick roundup of Stavery. Um, hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of judgments um, to get to this point in a decade um, and a half. Um, so hopefully I've managed to um, summarize it in, in successfully in some way for you. Um, so kind of moving on to our last couple of quick session, uh, sections here of the webinar, um, just another look at the kind of current complexity in terms of IHT discretion and pension death benefits. Um, something that we um, have been sort of uh, looking at in terms of our policy work, uh, certainly in relation to the Office for Tax Simplification work that was uh, undertaken on IHT a couple of years ago, um, and any consultations and feedback we, um, on changes to tax regi regimes. Um, I'll, I'll go through sort of what we're calling for um, in the next few slides. Um, so looking at pensions more widely than the Stavely case, where does this complexity still remain and what do we think could be done um, about it? So the issue of discretion is probably the first one. So it seems fairly simple um, that if the scheme administrator or trustees have discretion, then IHT doesn't generally apply to those death benefits. Um, it's not a binding nomination, unfortunately not. Um, so to do a proper job as a pension scheme administrator and trustee, it actually costs quite a lot of time and money and isn't quite simply a tick box exercise of following um, the member's nomination um, 
even in really simple cases, just gathering some information, it can add um, at least £100 and significantly more to complex cases where there's a potential um, huge number of, of beneficiaries. Um, the problem here is it's not only the time and cost, it, it can also add to delays when we are waiting for the information to be gathered and provided. And to be honest, this all kind of adds to what is clearly a very stressful and upsetting time for the bereaved um, as they sort of wait for a pension provider to ultimately decide who death benefits are payable to. Um, contentious cases um, we find are increasingly being referred to the pensions ombudsman which adds further again to the time and cost burden to enable us to actually make sure um, we know what acceptable discretion is and that we followed that process. Um, second we've got HMRC challenges so the prospect of challenges um, for IHT is still very real in our view um, unfortunately, this Supreme Court judgment didn't go the whole way to give us the full clarity that's needed. Now, of course, it was concentrated on the case of Mrs. Stavey, but um, one or two more paragraphs um, may have sort of given us that final clarity um, that we'd kind of hope for behind those headlines there. Um, provider withholding funds, this third point, um, it's something worth pointing out. Um, in cases of pension transfers and ill health, um, the pension provider might actually withhold a proportion of any death distribution after death um, until they receive confirmation that IHT and the bill has finally been settled and paid. Um, this might seem really, really strange, um, but there is actually provision in the IHTA 1984, um, Section 200, for those of you who are interested, um, that allows HMRC to pursue um, scheme administrators and trustees responsible um, for the distribution of death benefits if there had been a pension transfer in ill health um, prior to the client's death. So we've heard of a couple of cases where a pension provider has actually been pursued for IHT that remain unpaid. So don't, um, it, it's quite unusual, but if you do see um, a pension provider sort of looking to withhold funds without evidence, um, uh, until they've got evidence, sorry, of probate, um, that's the reason why. Okay, all of this together, that kind of fourth and final point, um, does nothing to bolster the reputation of pensions. Um, certainly, certainly for the layperson, um, pensions are viewed as complicated enough. And if this is just another area um, and, and people can't access death benefits on the death of loved ones, it just does nothing to, um, to uphold the reputation of pensions. So, as I say, another fine mess. So... It's all very well kind of going through where we think a mess is. What do we think the direction of travel would be and where might we go next? So we've gone through the technical aspects of the current rules um, in the first section, the Stavely case in a lot of detail and obviously in my kind of take on the, the mess, as I say, that we're currently in. What could be done to simplify matters and provide some clarity for, for clients, planners and their beneficiaries? Um, what changes do we think policymakers should look at to help clients? Now, in terms of policy change, um, pre-COVID, perhaps it was easier to call for, for simple simplicity. And I'll go through some of our policy ideas on this um, quickly in our last slide. But um, obviously now we're in a slightly different world, a um, bit of an under uh, exaggeration there. Um, there's, of course, a need to balance the books at the Treasury. OK, so policy ideas. Um, if you've got any more on this topic, please do let us know in the comments box. We'd, uh, we'd be glad to hear your policy ideas. The first one, perhaps an obvious one, you may have seen us call for this before, and I've certainly written articles on it, and so have my colleagues, um, is to remove pensions from the IHT regime completely. Now, for the most part, they, they are free of IHT, but there's obviously, as we've gone through today, um, cases where they can be brought into and claims can be made by HMRC. So it might seem like a bit of a bold call and a silly one, but kind of looking at our own our own house, um, if HMRC were worried about lost revenue, um, actually our experience tells us that the number of people that suddenly make increased contributions or, or make transfers in serious ill health is very low compared to the general level of contribution and transfer activity we see. Um, yet, as I went through in the kind of previous slide um, in discretion and covering um, covering that, the, the kind of time and cost burden of administering this, um, particularly legal costs for both sides when claims come in from HMRC for IHT, um, must be relatively high. 
I mean, look at the case of Stavely. I mean, I do keep banging on about it, but it was going on for over a decade. Um, and the legal fees, you know, going through those four courts must have been enormous. Um, even the, the judges in the Stavely case um, on that transfer issue too couldn't really um, unanimously agree on the intention of the IHT Act with regard to gratuitous benefit there. Um, so, you know, actually just simply removing pensions from IHT might not be as silly as it perhaps sounds. Um, I mean, look at pension freedoms and the changes to taxation of death benefits in 2015. That shows us that bold reform to legislation is, is achievable. Um, and it's kind of our view, isn't it, about time that this was extended to remove pensions from IHT. Now, this call that we've been making and banging the drum for what feels like forever to, to us um, in the policy team now was made pre-COVID. OK, so um, as you may know, we're in the middle of a consultation as to what the tax system might look like after COVID, what might need to be done to recoup some of the funds that have been spent um, to stimulate and, and try and save the economy. Um, so there is a need to balance the books. We are realistic about that. You can't simply be making calls now to take things out of tax regimes um, completely without um, looking to recoup some of that potential lost revenue. So one perhaps slightly unpopular measure that could be introduced is a, is a small flat rate charge on all death benefit distributions. Um, and we're talking mainly about defined contribution schemes here. OK. Um, Again, it might seem strange for a pension provider, SIP provider, to be making that call. Um, but as, as we would have all seen, the rumour mill's already started in terms of pension tax relief, um, reducing tax-free lump sums, um, and that started again. And there's obviously that rumour as well of a disagreement between Rishi, who we can see here on screen, and the Prime Minister himself as to what to do with the state pension triple lock. Um, so as I keep saying, the reality at this time is that any measure that seems to reduce tax take needs a fair balancing act, as we say. Um, perhaps in terms of that flat rate between 10 and 20 percent, um, again, it's just it's kind of a our, our, our call that we're sort of adding um, adding to it. As long as pensions are removed from IHTU completely, you know, we're not we're not saying slap a tax on the on, on pension death benefits without um, a little bit of give and take there. Um, I mean, going back to pension freedoms and the subsequent changes to death benefits there that George Osborne made in his time as chancellor, um, at the time they were viewed by pretty much everyone as being extremely generous. And uh, there was a slight worry that pensions were then being viewed as a kind of IHT avoidance vehicle passing down the generations for, for as long as possible, free of any, any tax charges. So it wouldn't be a massive surprise if something like that came in, in terms of a flat rate. Um, but again, it's just a policy idea. And I say, please do let us know if you have um, any further ideas. The kind of final um, point to make on this is a flat rate charge um, will remove this cliff edge at age 75. Okay, so ordinarily, we're talking about SIP de death benefits. Um, if uh, a member died under age 75, these are generally free of any tax, income tax or IHT after 75. It, um, they're starting to be taxed at the beneficiary's marginal rate of income tax. So um, if this flat rate charge on distributions um, at outset was made, um, that would remove that need for that age 75 cliff edge as well. Okay, so that brings me to the end of today's webinar. Um, well done for sticking with me, if you are still there, of course. Um, we have covered a lot today. Um, so as I say, please do let us know if you have any questions in that box on the right-hand side, any feedback, and um, of course, any policy ideas. Um, all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, see or speak to you soon. Thank you.